A little girl hides behind the leg of her mother, afraid and unsure as her eyes scan the mass of people around them. She and her family have just fled their home in Ethiopia amid a rising tide of violence and disruption. They are now staying at a camp for displaced persons along with thousands of others who, like them, can no longer go back to the home they once knew. There is overcrowding, disease, and very little food or water to go around. It's a heartbreaking scene, and sadly, not an unusual story. This little girl's struggles are a drop in the bucket when you take in the larger picture. The world is full of hard problems to solve. Hunger, homelessness, disease, natural disasters, education inequality, the list goes on and on, and there isn't a single corner of the world that is immune to all of these challenges. The need is overwhelming, but it cannot be ignored. As humans, we are all accountable to each other, but as humans, we are also limited in our capacity to help on a large scale. It's not impossible though, and certain organizations have found a way to have massive impacts, including UNICEF, the question is, how? I think this is what makes UNICEF unique in the humanitarian and development, global development sector. You know, it's a, it's a global organization that has boots on the ground in 190 countries. Each of those countries is led by a country representative who, you know, sits in the organizational structure, but has a lot of autonomy within those countries. But what, we're, what ties us all together is a, a mission that's focused on, on what we, we talk about, child rights, the rights of children to live healthy, growing, productive, safe lives. Michael Neinheis is the CEO of UNICEF USA. And while he fights every day to fulfill UNICEF's mission, he knows that a mission is not enough. Not when you consider the scale and scope at which UNICEF operates. UNICEF works all over the world on hundreds of projects simultaneously, and all of those projects have specific goals and metrics for success. With more than 10,000 employees and volunteers, steering a ship of that size is a massive undertaking. So how does UNICEF do it? What X factor can for-profit businesses learn from this thriving 75-year-old nonprofit? And most importantly, how is that little girl and others like her being helped right now? I'm Jeremy Bergeron, Vice President of Media Strategy at Mission.org. Welcome to Business X Factors. Each week, we'll take a look at the secret sauce that takes companies to the highest levels of success and unpack how they got there. We'll explore how these organizations are run, what's special about the people, culture, and processes that make it all happen. Michael is no stranger to stories like the one you heard at the top of the show. Throughout his career, Michael has been on the literal front lines of worldwide struggles. Initially, Michael worked as a journalist covering international stories in South America Afghanistan, and Europe. He heard and saw the stories of those in need, and he reported them to the world. It was doing this work when he actually began to realize that there was only so much a traditional path and centralized operations could do to help the niche problems worldwide. I was on a reporting trip in Central America, writing at the time about the HIV pandemic and was in Honduras. And while I was there, through some other connections, I ended up in this small little village, kind of a little squatter, a very poor village on a kind of dusty hillside. And I was introduced to a nurse whose name was Gloria, a local woman from that village who had grown up there and gone off to nursing school. And unlike her classmates who were all you know, jockeying for positions at the hospitals in the capital city where they would actually earn some kind of living. Her whole vision was to go back to her community to set up a health post and um, be a change agent in her community. 
So along the way, after nursing school, I had gone through a community health training program run by a, a U.S. nonprofit. And community health training is basically to deprogram medical people to think about health and not disease. And how do you promote good health, not just treat disease? So she went back to her community. She set up a little health post. I spent half a day with her in her community. You know, 90% of her time was spent out in the community working with mothers on home environments and nutrition, working with kids on hygiene and working with farmers on agriculture techniques to grow more nutritious foods. She was a dynamo and really making a difference in that community. And I just looked at her and I said, you know, who are we as outsiders to try to envision what these communities need? She knows maybe what we should just do is find people like her and support her in her work. And you know what? I think that's what I want to do for my life, for my life going forward. I think I just want to figure out how I can help people like her do her work. Maybe I've been a journalist for 10 years. And one of the things about being a journalist is you are an observer. You're not a participant. And um, I think I was to the point where I, where I really wanted to be a participant and not just an observer. He was ready to take action, and that desire led him into the nonprofit world. He took a job at MAP International, an organization that provides medicines and health supplies to people in need. He began as director of communications, but quickly rose in the organization, becoming CEO of MAP in the year 2000. 14 years later, Michael stepped into the same role at AmeriCare's and after a few years leading the charge, his next big opportunity landed right on his lap in 2020. I was really happily working at AmeriCares. I think we'd done some great things in the six years I was there, growing the organization a lot, really ramping up its programmatic impact. But, you know, every once in a while you get a call from a recruiter who wants to talk to you about another job. And most of those I let go by. But when this recruiter said the name UNICEF, I just, perked up a little bit because it's UNICEF. If you want to impact kids around the world, there's no better place to do it. If you're like me, you might be familiar with UNICEF thanks to its various fundraising efforts, particularly around the holiday or times of crisis. Unsurprisingly, that was even Michael's first introduction to UNICEF. I've known about UNICEF since I was a kid. I was one of those kids who did trick or treat for UNICEF when I was a little boy, going door to door in my little town in Minnesota where I grew up, not really knowing too much about it, but understanding that there were kids around the world that needed our help and I could do something about it. And so UNICEF, you know, the brand just stuck in my brain as it has for a lot of people from my generation and, and, and after who had a chance to do that. What Michael has found out since those young years is that the organization is so much more than just Halloween boxes. And his job as president of UNICEF USA is a complicated and sophisticated dance that requires the right skills and people in place to collaborate with. UNICEF actually is very large, global, decentralized, many component parts all working together. And some of kind of the secret sauce of UNICEF is in that. And I can talk about that a little bit. But so I run UNICEF USA, which is one of the many component parts of UNICEF that work together to deliver results for children around the world. It's considerably different than, than what I was doing before at both AmeriCares and MAP, where I was the CEO of a private, independent organization where I had span of control over all of the work. At UNICEF USA, our, our work here is to rally the American people, including its government, to support UNICEF's work around the globe, and then to represent UNICEF here in the, in, in the US, including in the work that we do with youth here in our country. You know, I run a very big organization, UNICEF USA, it is one component part of this massive global thing called UNICEF. And so it's a very different job because not only do I have my own organization and our own constituency, but I have all of my peers who run other parts of the big UNICEF family 
to engage with as well. And there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of negotiation, a lot of diplomacy, a lot of debate to get things done. And what exactly does UNICEF get done? Well, it helps little children like the one in Ethiopia and others just like her in every corner of the world. UNICEF stands for United Nations Children's Fund and was founded in 1946 to help children in countries devastated by World War II. Since its founding, UNICEF's goals and visions have grown, and today UNICEF works to protect and provide for some of the most vulnerable children around the world. In 2020 alone, UNICEF provided critical water, sanitation, and hygiene services and supplies to 106 million people, including 58 million children in 153 countries. The organization also supported remote learning for more than 301 million children. And during the global crisis that was the COVID-19 pandemic, UNICEF responded by providing expertise and logistical support in the COVID-19 Vaccines Global Access Initiative. This is also called COVAX. UNICEF's commitment resulted in the financing of COVID-19 vaccines for 92 low- and middle-income countries and prepared countries to deliver the vaccine by managing procurement, freight, logistics, and storage, among other things. It's a logistical challenge that UNICEF is still helping navigate. This is, you know, historic effort on UNICEF's part. It is the, the first time the world has done a global vaccine campaign. It is the biggest single effort that UNICEF has ever done. Uh, and we've been around 75 years. And it's essential if we really want to, on a global scale, end this pandemic. The work that we're doing, the reason UNICEF is called in to do this work is because we're the only organization that has the global infrastructure to procure and deliver vaccines everywhere. And that's built off of our experience every year vaccinating almost half of the world's young children with basic childhood vaccines. So we have the procurement mechanisms in place. We have the supply chain in place. We have a, a part, uh, one of the components of UNICEF, I talked about sort of the decentralized nature of the whole thing. One of the components is what we call supply division, which is based out of Copenhagen, Denmark. And it is the largest humanitarian warehouse, distribution center, and supply chain in the world. And it procures and distributes four and a half billion dollars worth of products every year. So we, we have that all in place. And, and we were called on by the World Health Organization and, and Gavi, the Global Vaccine Alliance, and, and others who were beginning to think about how do we vaccinate the world, they turned to UNICEF because we're the only ones who can deliver on that promise to get vaccines as equitably as possible everywhere. UNICEF was set up to handle these large-scale global problems, and it has succeeded thanks to the processes and people Michael and his predecessors have put in place. The question, though, is how? What is it that UNICEF does that makes it possible to have a global impact while still keeping the work personal so that the little girls in Ethiopia and elsewhere never get lost in the fray? And why don't more people know about the problems and the solutions UNICEF are working on? We'll dig into that after the break. Stay with us. When you look at all of the incredible work UNICEF has done and is currently working on, you can't help but be impressed. And from the start, the reason UNICEF has been able to succeed is thanks to a decentralized approach to the work it does. UNICEF was embracing the decentralization of things long before it became the trendy topic it is today. It's only in recent years that cryptocurrencies, blockchain, smart contracts, and open source technology have led to the decentralization of industries like finance, cloud storage, and even marketing and advertising. But when we look back at history, decentralization of organizations and efforts have been a key approach for thousands of years. All the way back to 400 BC, 
when Jethro advised Moses to distribute his responsibilities to various levels in the hierarchy to avoid burnout and scale his efforts. So let's talk about that decentralized piece. I think that's interesting. Um, how is UNICEF USA, how is UNICEF at, at large able to be so impactful and a measured approach to that? And you can literally see a lot of the things that are being done. And it's this, like you said, it's a massive decentralized you know, component, this company. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, okay. So the, the most important, because so maybe two really critical pieces of it. And I think this is what makes UNICEF unique in the humanitarian and development, global development sector. You know, it's a it's a global organization that has boots on the ground in 190 countries. Each of those countries is led by a country representative who, you know, sits in the organizational structure, but has a lot of autonomy within those countries. But what we're what ties us all together is a, a mission that's focused on, on what we, we talk about child rights, the rights of children to live uh, healthy, growing, productive, safe lives. And all of that is anchored in in a document called the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which the UN approved and governments across the country, it's, it's the, or across the world, it's the largest, it's, it's the most widely ratified human, uh, human rights treaty in the world. Convention on the Rights of the Child. And it is a foundational document that we all look to, to drive our work. So we are this big decentralized thing, but all of us deeply committed to this foundational idea of child rights and of the principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And so it holds us all together so we don't spin off in, in odd directions or whatnot. So, so that's sort of the big global piece that holds us all together. But the implementation of what we do is incredibly local, incredibly local. And, you know, the, the country offices that deliver the programs to kids in low and middle income countries are, you know, again, they have a lot of autonomy but underneath that idea of child rights and, and, the, and the basic framework of UNICEF programming. And they work, you know, very locally with a local health center, with a local school, with a local nonprofit or local NGO that's delivering services and, and UNICEF helps them carry out those services better with governments, national and local governments. It's a very local expression of this. And so, you know, we hear a lot about, you know, think uh, global, act local is kind of a, you know, a little bit of a cliche phrase these days. UNICEF effectively for 75 years has done this really, really well to have a global mindset and a global structure that allows for very local expression uh, of the work. And I do think that's our secret sauce. That is our X factor, if you will, that, that we figured out how to do that and have sustained it over 75 years. Everything UNICEF does is decentralized because it has to be. The needs of that little girl in Ethiopia are different than the needs of the community in Ghana. And the regulations and government entities in each of those cases mean that there is no way that UNICEF could have a centralized system or process. Instead, UNICEF gives autonomy to all the people that work to fulfill the mission stated in the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There are local people who know how to make a difference and how do we help them do that? And in UNICEF's case, a lot of those local people are UNICEF staffers who are in those communities getting things done. Being able to operate in an agile way that can quickly adapt to market needs is a crucial component to the work that UNICEF supports. And the organizational structure allows for just this. As the saying goes, think globally, act locally. UNICEF works all over the world. It means you have it means you have to partner with different governments, work within different social structures, and understand different cultures and the needs of all those different kinds of people. How does UNICEF make all of these connections in the first place? How do you juggle all the various interest groups in order to deliver the aid and create the change that you're making right now and have been for such a long time? Uh, every place that UNICEF works, UNICEF is there by the invitation of the of the of the government of the national government there. So it comes built in with those connections, which are really important to make things happen. 
And as I said, the sort of the local expression of UNICEF in every one of those countries definitely has the UNICEF imprint on it, but the work may lean one way or the other based on the needs in that country, the desires of the government in that country. You know, we're a partnership organization. We don't do these things by ourselves. We're in partnership with the government. We're in partnership with local NGOs that carry out a lot of the work on our behalf. We're in partnership with the Ministry of Education and the schools, with health centers there. So it really is a partnership model, but it's a pretty big bureaucracy. And I don't say that in a negative way. So you need, you need bureaucracy to, to, to run a big global thing. And there are you know, lots of channels of communication back and forth built between the program offices in a country and the, the headquarters of UNICEF in New York and Geneva and organizations like ours that are supporting all of that. Uh, in fact, I, I would say that there's so much communication; it's sometimes paralyzing. <laughs> so this is one of the this is one of the other you know parts of it. You have to figure out what you need to carry out your work. The idea of partnership also spills into the fact that UNICEF is a nonprofit organization, which means it relies on donors to fund its work around the globe. UNICEF is uh, funded through voluntary contributions from governments and from the private sector, meaning foundations, corporations, individual philanthropists, you know, regular donors, uh, individual donors. And so we have to prove our worth to all of them every day. You know, there's no handouts for us. UNICEF itself is a UN agency, United Nations agency, but doesn't get any money from the UN. It has to go seek the money in donation from governments and from the private sector. And therefore we have to, you know, we're held accountable to deliver results or they don't give us the money to do the work. We take very seriously the establishment of goals, metrics, indicators, monitoring and evaluation. We have teams of people who are deeply experienced at this. We, we deliver results, you know, all the way up to the top level to our, you know, to the UNICEF executive board that represents the organization globally. So at every level of the organization, there are uh, metrics that we're trying to achieve with clear indicators and you know, progress indicators along the way. And people are held accountable to them. You know, we want to we want to get stuff done. We're not just do-gooders. But the partnership with donors is more deeply rooted than a simple transaction of cash for good work being done. Michael explains that it's through working closely with donors that the magic of UNICEF can actually be brought to life. I'll, I'll give you an example of how some of these partnerships sort of weave together. We had a, a donor here in the U.S. who was really taken by the plight of, of homeless kids in India and wanted to do a project in India and sort of envisioned herself what that project might be and was willing to put a lot of money out to make it happen. Obviously wanted to engage with her, but didn't think she had quite the exact experience base to know exactly how that project should run. So we opened the dialogue with our colleagues in India, with the UNICEF India office and their education team there about how to, how to work this. They're informed by the Indian government's uh, priorities in the country of India and, and sort of together with influence from the Indian Ministry of Education, with the technical expertise of the India office education staff, with this donor and her resources and ideas, with our experience pulling together all those pieces to make things happen, you know, we put together a really tremendous project there that wouldn't have happened without all of those people coming together around the same table to say, how do we have the biggest impact possible? And how do we bring the expertise from all of those pieces together? And sometimes that's more complicated and takes a little bit longer than somebody who just has a great idea and wants to go do it. But again, if you want effective, sustainable work, you do the hard work of building partnerships and bringing the right expertise around the table to make it happen. And I think that's one of the the real, if I think about UNICEF USA itself, the work that we do, and you know, our kind of X factor is this ability to pull all of these pieces together and to, to be the negotiator, to be the prompter, to be the catalyst that brings together people with resources, UNICEF staff in the, in the field that ultimately implement things, the needs of communities that we wanna serve, 
the interests of those governments and kind of pull all those pieces together to make something great happen. As Michael mentioned a few minutes ago, bureaucracy has a tendency to get clunky and can negatively impact efficiency across organizations. But rather than rely on a system that funnels decisions up the chain to the stakeholder at the top, UNICEF has chosen to flip this on its head, instead leveraging multi-level systems to raise the voices of those on the ground so decisions can be made in a much more informed and thoughtful way. Thanks to UNICEF's entities around the world, mixed with the commitment and communication of staff in the U.S. and the vision of a donor, children in India are being offered education and resources they otherwise lack. But that's just one out of hundreds of examples of UNICEF's powers at work. Remember that little girl in Ethiopia? Her name is Gobze. She's eight years old. And if you visit UNICEF's website, you'll find a picture of her smiling face. She has fresh water to drink every day. She sings her ABCs and she plays games with her friends. She's being supported by the work UNICEF is doing on the ground there with partners to provide supplies, vaccines, and health services. And yes, this is Gobze's personal story, but it's also the story of 100,000 others who were similarly displaced. The work is hard, but the goal of bringing equity, safety, and positive change to children everywhere is what keeps UNICEF and its partners moving forward, one project at a time, one country at a time, one little girl at a time, but also all at once in a decentralized and beautifully local way that makes it possible to address the world's toughest problems. You've been listening to Business X Factors, created by Mission.org and brought to you by Highland. If you like this show, please be sure to subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app. We'd also be so grateful if you rated and reviewed us on Apple Podcasts, as this helps ensure that more amazing listeners like you find this show. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, Vice President of Media Strategy at Mission.org. And I'll catch you next time on Business X Factors.